Today we'll talk about diagnosis of um, ST elevation in mind in the emergency room and different situations that makes uh, the diagnosis difficult. Uh, the key message to start with is that the diagnosis of STEMI relies mainly on history and ECG finding. We don't care about uh, trobonine. Uh, yes, trobonin is essential, but it's not necessary for the diagnosis of STEMI and we don't have uh, to wait for that. However, if the diagnosis is in doubt or ECG is inconclusive, then we have to wait for troponin while repeating the ECG every 20 to 30 minutes or do a focus, uh, focused echo. So if you look at the recent guidelines, we find that, is, that uh, 12 lead ECG should be done within 10 minutes and class one monitoring should be done in all patients. Again, it's class one. Uh, posterior leads and uh, RV leads are also important and they are class 2A. Blood sampling is important, but it is not, it's not necessary for the decision of treatment. It's only for diagnosis, because if it's negative, then this is not ST elevation in mind. So how to diagnose uh, ST elevation in mind in the emergency room? If a patient comes with chest discomfort, as we discussed uh, the last time, uh, within 10 minutes, you have to take an abbreviated history, do a physical examination, take an ECD, and do a uh, troponin. The chest pain characteristics, as we discussed in, in the previous uh, lecture. However, the main modality for diagnosis of STEMI is ECG. If the ECG is showing ST elevation, then this is STEMI. If not, this is maybe a STEMI, and you have to do further testing. However, we have to know that the ECG is not diagnostic in 45% and may be normal in 20% of patients who have an MI later on, on uh, echo or coronary angio. So if the suspicion is high, repeat ECG every 20 minutes intervals, do echo, wait for troponin as we discussed last time, the algorithm of zero one hour and zero two hours or three hours if you need to uh, resort to that. So how to read the ECG? Uh, first, we look at the uh, elevation of ST segment and we measure the elevation at the J point, which is one. So in relation to the uh, PR segment, however, if the baseline is stable, which means the TB segment is stable, it's not uh, irregular or, or hectic, then it's better to take the TB segment. It's more accurate than uh, the uh, PR segment. So you measure if there is ST elevation more than one, one millimeter in two contiguous leads, this is ST elevation uh, MI. Uh, the criteria that were put by the ACCHA uh, guidelines and the AAC guidelines applies only when there is no LVH or left bundle branch Recording. Doctor Ala, had a shawl or not?
أما هي ميوتد أور وات؟ الظاهر علق دكتور الفيديو هاي اوكي كان يسيب نا؟ اي الان شغال دكتور اوكي سو شال وي ستارت اجين؟ As we said, there is a ST elevation from V2 to V4, hyperacute T wave, ST elevation in one and AVL, and reciprocal uh, changes in uh, the inferior lead, uh, mainly in lead three. Uh, Doctor, uh, uh, can you share the share again? Start sharing again the slide. Okay, just a second. I think it logged me out. Okay, can you see it now? Yes, clearly. Okay, so as we said, we have all the features of anterior lateral uh, MI on this ECG. Uh, what about this ECG? Anyone, please? No one wants to read the ECG? Yes, Doctor. Yes. Uh, uh, so this is a tool for the ECG. And uh, we can see there is uh, ST elevation uh, in, uh, in V2, V3, V4, and V5, V6, and lead 1, and also in, uh, in AVM. So uh, this ECG, I will say there is, uh, with reciprocal, the C depression in the inferior lead 3 and AVF. Excellent. So again, we see another anterior lateral MI. What about this? Shabab, is you afraid? Even diffuse ST elevation. Sorry, there is ST elevation from P1 to P6. But it's not clear still fashion actually, G point, it's not. Uh, okay, there are several types of uh, ST elevation. It can be <laughs> convex and it can be the tombstone. We'll talk about it uh, later on. And it can be concave. And it can be as, as you see here, which is diffuse ST elevation. This is like almost a tombstone. Uh, mm. You see that there's extensive, this indicates an extensive anterior lateral MI, okay, and usually as associated with uh, poor prognosis. This is what they call tombstone, okay? And usually it indicates proximal LED or left main disease. Usually these patients, they are either in cardiogenic shock uh, or in cardiac arrest, and they have very high risk of uh, mortality. This is, they call it tombstoning pattern. Okay, this is another ECG. Anyone, what do you see? Uh, yes, doctor, uh, ST elevation uh, from V1 to uh, V6. With ST elevation again in uh, two, three, and AVF. Yes, excellent. So, what do you what do you comprehend from this? What do you think this diagnosis is? So when do you see this? When when do you see such pattern of ECG? This is when you have type three LED or rubberand LED that su supplies the inferior wall. You will find. Uh, that there is anterior inferior ST elevation MI 
this indicates around, around uh, LAD or type 3 LAD uh, infarction. Okay, so how do you predict the site of LAD occlusion? There are two sites, either proximal to the first septal or ocial or proximal uh, to uh, D1. Signs of basal septal involvement, if there is septal, uh, the first septal is involved, there will be ST elevation in AVR, ST elevation in V1 more than 2.5 millimeters, Usually there is a complete right bundle branch block because the right bundle is supplied by uh, the first septal or the LAD and there will be ST depression in V5. Uh, if it's proximal uh, to, to D1, D1 usually supplies the high lateral uh, part of the LV and there will be ST elevation in one uh, and uh, EVL or Q wave. The ST depression is more than one millimeter usually in two, three, and the AVF. And these are the reciprocal changes of the AVL lead. And we'll explain this uh, later on. As you see here, there is ST elevation from V1 to uh, V3. There is ST elevation in one and AVL. There is the V1, as you see, elevation is more than 2.5 uh, millimeter. There is right bundle and left anterior vesicular block. And this indicates that there's an ostial LED or proximal LED occlusion to the first uh, septal. The lateral wall is usually supplied either by D1, by the first uh, obtuse marginal or the second, and sometimes by the ramus. Um, usually lateral STEMI is part of the anterior uh, MI. However, isolated is much less common than anterior lateral MI. Uh, lateral extension can occur in the anterior, inferior, or posterior MI. It indicates a large territory of myocardium at risk with worse uh, prognosis. So how do you recognize lateral MI? There's usually a ST elevation in one AVL, V5, and V6. These are the lateral leads with the reciprocal changes in three and AVF. Uh, sometimes isolated ST elevation and AV and in one and AVL referred as high lateral STEMI. So it only indicates diagonal uh, infarction. And there are three categories of uh, lateral MI, which can be anterior lateral STEMI due to LED occlusion, inferior or posterior lateral STEMI due to CERC, or isolated lateral infarction due uh, to occlusion of smaller branches, either D1, OM, or Remus uh, intermediate. Okay, who reads, who wants to read this ECG? ما حنخلصه بساعة كذا. No one. There is there is yeah. elevation in lead one AVL and uh, also in uh, V five six. There is ST depression in inferior leads. Reciprocal changes. Okay, this is true. There is ST elevation one AVL depression in the inferior leads. Uh, there is ST depression also in V one. Yes, V1 and V2. And this usually indicates what? Posterior. Either ischemia reciprocal changes, ischemia or, distance, or even uh, there's posterior MI. So whenever you see ST depression in V1, V2, you have to consider always the presence of posterior uh, MI. What about this ECG? I ST uh, elevation. Uh... Uh, yes, go ahead. With uh, lead one and uh, depression in three and AVF. This what uh, even V two, but it's uh, one small sphere and it's not. Uh... Okay, if you look at the R waves in the V one to V. Uh, four or even five, you see that there's poor progression. This indicates an old MI with a new lateral or high lateral myocardial uh, infarction. Okay, this is another example also. You see that there is 
uh, ST elevation in lead one and AVL with the reciprocal changes in the inferior uh, leads. There is also ST elevation in uh, V2. So in high lateral MI, what do you look for? ST elevation in AVL and V2 also. This can happen with lateral MI, lead one, AVL and V2. Upright T wave in AVL and V2 also indicates a high lateral myocardial uh, infarction along with the reciprocal changes in the uh, in inferior leads. Uh, so ST elevation in AVL plus V2 and lack of ST elevation in other precordial leads has 89 or almost 90% positive predictive uh, value for MI of the anterior wall caused by D1 occlusion. So this could be another pattern of the first diagonal occlusion where you see AVL and V2 uh, ST elevation only. Okay, this is another example also, which is an anterior lateral uh, ST elevation uh, MI with reciprocal changes. You see that there is uh, ST elevation in almost all the leads except uh, V1 with inferior uh, ST depression. This is again another example. Who wants to read this ECG? Yes, doctor. Uh, there's uh, ST elevation in lead 2, 3 AVF, V5, V6, with ST depression in uh, V1, V2. Uh, so this could, yeah, this could have what? Inferolateral STEMI. And posterior yes, extension. Inferolateral STEMI. Yes. So inferolateral STEMI with posterior extension, this usually goes with the SEAC occlusion. So from the ECG, you can really localize which uh, vessel is uh, involved. This is another example of, of inferior posterior lateral. And you see there's ST elevation in two, three AVF. Uh, there's ST depression in V1 and V2, and there's ST elevation in uh, some in lead one, uh, also in V5, V6. So sometimes you don't see that there's ST elevation in all the leads that correspond to the lateral or to the inferior or posterior, but you have really to put the, uh, whatever finding you find in the ECG together to find uh, a, diagno a diagnosis. So this is inferior with posterior with lateral uh, ST elevation MI. And again, when you have all of these, most likely it is the CERC occlusion. Okay, uh, inferior STEMI is, is the most common probably ST elevation uh, MI that we encounter. It occurs in 40 to 50 percent of patients. And usually there is ST elevation in two, three AVF with Many patients, they have hyper, hyper acute T wave preceding uh, this change in, this changes. There's a reciprocal ST depression in AVL uh, and usually progress to Q wave and two, three AVF. Uh, with inferior STEMI, you have always to do the RV leads because there is RV infarction in 40% uh, of these patients. Always you have to consider and look for uh, heart block or uh, second or third degree AV block, uh, which occur in around 20% uh, of patient. And again, you have to look at features of posterior infarction. So with inferior STEMI, look for RV in mind, posterior in mind, heart block. Uh, uh, and uh, because especially RV in mind is important when it comes to uh, treatment. Uh, AVL is a lead that is very important. AVL is the only lead that truly is reciprocal to the inferior wall. Uh, it is a sensitive marker of inferior infarction uh, with, when there's changes in these leads, in this lead, there's more than 90% probability that there's inferior wall MI, especially when you find the ECG is not diagnostic, when you find very minimal ST elevation, and the inferior leads, which we see so many times in, in, in the meeting. So and when you are in doubt, always look at AVL. Uh, so how do you localize which part of the RCA is occluded? Uh, or which part? Is it the CERC? Is it the LAD? Or is it the um, right coronary artery? 
In 80% of cases, the inferior stemi is due to RCA occlusion. In 18%, it's due to CERC occlusion. In the remaining, it's due to uh, type 3 uh, LAD. The RCA usually supplies the medial part of the inferior wall. So there will be ST elevation in three, more than two, along with reciprocal changes in lead one. Uh, so uh, signs of right ventricular infarction also you will see ST elevation in V1 and uh, V4 of the right lead. So if you see that there's ST elevation in lead three, more than two, okay, with reciprocal changes, uh, and, and lead one, this is RCA. If you see that the ST elevation in lead two is equal to lead three, and there is no ST depression in lead one, this is most likely uh, the CERC, and it may show also that there is lateral uh, uh, MI. So always look at two, three, and one. ST depression and ST elevation in these leads decide whether it's inferior or uh, sorry, it's right or uh, CERC territory. Uh, if you look at this ECG, you will find that there is hyperacute T wave in lead two, three, and AVF. And there's relative loss of the uh, R wave. There's LST elevation and Q wave in uh, lead three, as you see. And there is a reciprocal ST depression and T wave inversion is in, in lead AVL. If you see AVL is a mirror image of lead three, by the way, and you will see it in uh, the next slide. The ST elevation in lead three is more than lead two, and there's some ST depression in uh, lead one. So this, most likely this is the RCA occlusion. And you see there's V4R, there's some uh, around 0.5 millimeter ST elevation or one millimeter ST elevation in uh, V4R. So as I mentioned, you know, there's the AVL is a mirror image of lead three. If you invert AVL, look at three and AVL, it, it's identical. So always this gives you a clue that this is uh, inferior wall MI. And inversion of AV, uh, AVL with ST morphology is now uh, one of the diagnostic features in uh, subtle uh, inferior uh, ST elevation MI. Okay, again, if you look at the CG, ACG, there is a ST elevation in two, three, and AVF. Again, there is a Q wave, which is prominent in uh, three, and there's some also in uh, lead uh, AVF. And there's ST elevation in lead two equal to lead Three. This most likely is what? This is yeah, a CERC occlusion because lead two is almost equal to lead three and there's no changes in uh, lead one. This is another um, ST elevation, inferior uh, STEMI where you see there's this marked ST elevation in two, three and uh, AVF and there's significant reciprocal changes in AVL. And again, if you look at AVL and lead three, they are mirror image if you uh, invert them. There's also ST elevation in V1 uh, and V2. So what does it suggest? It suggests that there is RV infarction in uh, this patient. So this patient should have a right ventricular uh, leads. Again, this is a massive, inferior ST elevation in mice. So you, you see there, there are different patterns of ECG and ST elevation. It's not always the same. Again, if you look at uh, ST elevation in three is more than two, and there is some, there's ST depression or changes in lead one. This is RCA occlusion. And again, AVL is a mirror image of uh, lead three. There's also lateral extension, if you see, there's V5, V6, there's uh, ST uh, elevation. So this is an inferior lateral uh, MI. This is an example of uh, ST elevation uh, MI where th there are subtle changes. You see there's minimal ST elevation in two, three and AVF, but AVL is showing there's some uh, ST depression. 
this patient was taken to the cat lab and there was uh, ST elevation in mice. So if you find ST depression in AVL, this indicates inferior in my when there are subtle changes or very little uh, changes to indicate uh, inferior STEMI. So uh, around 20% of uh, inferior in my they develop, as we said, second or third degree uh, AV block because the AV nodal artery is supplied by the RCA in 80% of cases. This again could be because of uh, benzoyl jerish uh, reflex where there is increased vagal tone. 50% of these patients, they progress from first to winky back, second and complete heart block, or they could present with complete heart block. Again, uh, we know that the sinus node is also supplied by the RCA in 60% uh, percent of patients. And they could present with sinus node dysfunction with bradycardia, bosses, sinus, uh, atrial exit block, bradyarrhythmia, and so on. Uh, this is an example of inferior STEMI with third degree AV block. If you look at the ECG, there is uh, no correlation between or dissociation between the QRS and the P wave with extensive ST elevation in two, three, and AVF. Which artery is involved in this patient? And why? OCS. Anyone? Sorry? Uh, RCA. RCA, why? 80% supply. Uh, because uh, the uh, three more than the two, and there is a ST depression fill uh, one. Excellent. You know, knowledge is power. When, when you know what to look for, you know how to uh, read the ECG and you know how to diagnose your uh, patient. Okay, now, you know, they, they, uh, there's a new terminology which is coming out, especially in 2020 and 2021, which is uh, occlusion myocardial infarction rather than ST elevation uh, infarction. Because sometimes, as, as we saw in the inferior leads or even other leads or left mandibular block, you will find that the patient has MI, but there's no features on the ECG or clear features to indicate that there is uh, myocardial uh, infarction. Uh, now we'll move to the supplemental leads. Always when your diagnosis is in doubt and your ECG is not informative, you have to do the right leads and the posterior leads. And you do it when the ECG is not diagnostic, when there is suspicion of posterior wall MI and in all inferior wall uh, MIs. The posterior wall uh, infarction occur in around 20% of uh, ST elevation in my usually with inferior or lateral uh, location. It indicates a larger in my higher risk of death and arrhythmia. However, isolated posterior in my can occur, but it's uh, less common. Usually it's around 3%. However, in different series, it's between 3 to 11%. Uh, and it can be easily missed if you don't look carefully at the ECG, especially in V1 uh, and V2. Uh, usually it's due to CR occlusion. However, occasionally the lateral wall, uh, this uh, posterior wall is supplied by the RCA or the posterior descending artery. So always look for posterior STEMI in lateral MI, inferior MI, and non-diagnostic ECG. And if you remember the examples we showed, the lateral MI and the inferior MI, there was some uh, ST depression in the V1, V2, indicating that there is a posterior uh, extension. The leads are a mirror image of V4, V5, V6, but they are uh, at the back, usually at the left axillary line, tip of the scapula and uh, tip of the scapula and uh, the paraspinal uh, line also. So, posterior MI is suggested when you look at V1 to V3. If there is horizontal ST depression or flat in V1 to V3, if there is tall broad R, which is more than 30 millisecond or upright T wave, which is an hyperacute T wave. And remember that V1, V2, usually the T wave is 
is not that prominent. When it is prominent, you should suspect that there is uh, an MI. And if there is a dominant uh, R wave with R to S ratio more than V1, especially uh, more than one in uh, V2. <clears throat> so what, what do you see here? There, there's significant ST depression in V2. The R wave uh, is uh, more is almost more than one uh, compared to the S wave, and there's hyperacute T wave. And th again, this is the R to S ratio. So we have prominent R wave, we have ST depression, we have hyperacute T wave, and we have the ratio of the R to uh, S and uh, V1 to V3. Usually the best is uh, V2 to indicate uh, the posterior wall in MI. Uh, because the posterior uh, wall is recorded from the anterior side, that's why the ECG changes will be the opposite. You will see ST depression rather than uh, ST elevation in V1 to uh, V3 uh, or V4, but usually up to V3. So if you take V2 and revert it, you will see that there is an ST depression. This is always a clue when you are in the emergency room just to revert the ECG and look at V1, V2. Uh, if there's ST elevation, usually this indicates uh, a posterior wall in mind. So the ST elevation is a mirror image of the ST depression in V2. The, is, uh, the R wave is a mirror image of the Q wave. It should be the Q wave if you look at the posterior leads. And the T wave in Virgin uh, is a mirror image of the hyperacute T wave in V2. So always revert the ECG and look at it. So who wants to read this ECG? Okay, there is ST elevation in the inferior leads, uh, lead two, three, and AVF with ST depression from V1 to V3 as well, which indicate uh, inferior with posterior MI. What about the lateral leads? There may be there some. Yes, there is ST depression also in V4 uh, and some ST elevation in V5, V6. And lead one also, there's some uh, ST yeah. elevation. So, so this, lateral, uh, lateral, inferior, and posterior, I would say. Okay, exactly. This is most likely, this is inferior lateral uh, MI. As you see, there is ST elevation in the inferior leads and in the lateral leads. And there is ST depression in V1, V2, and V3. Again, if you repair this ECG, you will see exactly that there's an ST elevation in, in, in these leads rather than uh, ST depression. Again, you will see all the criteria. So you'll see the ST depression, you will see the prominent R wave, the hyperacute uh, T wave, and the R to S ratio more than one. All of these four features, they indicate that there is a posterior extension or infarction along with the inferior MI. So again, let's memorize it. There's ST depression. There's prominent R wave, which should not be there in, in, in uh, V2 and V3. This has to be a transition uh, of R wave. There is hyperacute T wave, which again should not be there. And there is R to S ratio more than one. All of these features, they indicate the presence of posterior myocardial uh, infarction. So we have all the features we discussed about the posterior uh, myocardial infarction. Okay, let's read again this ECG. I need somebody to mention all the four criteria. Uh, uh, two, three AVF, uh, mainly two and AVF in the, I mean, inferior leads. ST elevation and uh, even the lead one. And uh, regarding the V1, we said ST depression and the hyperacuity wave with uh, also the prominent uh, R wave in V2, V2 and V3 mainly. And the uh, RS uh, ratio more than one. This Excellent. is uh, so. So we have all the, all the four features. If you look at the 
end of the ECG, you will find that there is ST elevation in uh, V7 and V8 and V9. So this is an extensive uh, posterior wall in mind. Okay, inferior, posterior, MI. And you see all the four features. You see that there's ST depression, there's prominent R, there's hyperacute T wave, and there's R to S more than one in V2. Okay. Now we will discuss RBMI. Who wants to read this ECG? Okay, RBMI is seen in one third of inferior wall MI, which is around 35%. Uh, always record the right-sided leads in all inferior wall MI. It is usually uh, suspected in any inferior wall MI if it's associated with ST elevation in V1. So we will just memorize again, like in posterior MI, the features of RBMI in inferior wall MI. ST elevation in V1, ST elevation uh, in lead two, three, more than V1 uh, or V1, V2, sorry. Uh, ST elevation in V1, if you look at the second ECG, there may be, there's some ST elevation in V1 plus ST depression in lead two is highly specific for this. You don't see it very clear here, but whenever you, saw, you see ST depression in V1, uh, sorry, ST elevation in, in V1 and ST depression in V2, this is most likely right ventricular uh, infarction. And sometimes you find isoelectric uh, uh, ST segment in V1 with ST depression in V2. So these are the features of RV involvement. There may be ST elevation in V1, or ST elevation in V1 with ST depression in V2, and this is highly specific as we said. Uh, there may be isoelectric uh, in V1, ST segment in V1 and uh, ST depression in V2. So what should you do next? We should do the RV uh, leads. Can somebody read this ECG? There is ST elevation in the inferior leads, uh, lead two, three, or AVF, and uh, ST depression in the lateral lead uh, one and AVL, plus uh, ST elevation in the V4R, V5R, uh, also V6R, which indicate uh, inferior posterior, uh, sorry, inferior MI with uh, RV infarction. Okay, uh, which RT do you think is in, in, involved? I see. Exactly, the RCA, because three more than one, and there's ST depression in uh, lead one. However, you have to remember that these ECG changes are transient, and it disappears within 10 hours in 50% uh, uh, of patients. So when there, there's late presentation, you may not uh, see it. Okay, again, what about this ECG? Anyone can read it? Yeah, and tell me the features we discussed, please. ST elevation in uh, inferior leads two, three, and ABF. And also in V1, V2, there is ST elevation. Uh, where fetal subacral changes will lead one, ABL, where V6 as well. So this is inferior, um, inferior MI with the uh, right ventricular. Uh, involvement because V1, there's ST elevation, V2. Excellent. Okay, uh, what about the timeline of ECG? What happens uh, to the ECG after myocardial infarction? It usually evolves over seconds to years from hyperacute T wave, which is usually seconds to minutes, to ST elevation, which happens between minutes to hours, to Q wave, which again could develop within hours to days, to T wave inversion, and ST uh, may normalize uh, over years, or the T wave uh, also stay inverted or it may normalize. So in the acute stage where there is ongoing myocardial injury, this is the normal uh, QRS. Within seconds to minutes, there will be hyperacute T wave. That's why we have to repeat the ECG if there is hyperacute T wave, and we will discuss 
the hyperacute T, uh, T wave uh, later on. Um, with again, there will be ST uh, elevation with reciprocal changes according to the site of the uh, infarction. In the intermediate stage, which is between hours, two days, there will be a small R or loss of the R. There will be T wave inversion, Q wave will develop. And the criteria for Q, Q wave is that it has to be more than 0 0.04 seconds in duration and the amplitude has to be more than 25% of the uh, R wave or more than one millimeter. And any Q in lead V1 to V3 is abnormal. Q waves should not be seen in these leads. Uh, over weeks to years, uh, there, will be, there may be a persistent broad or deep Q wave and the SC segment may rec uh, recover or stay depressed. The T wave also may normalize and stay uh, or stay uh, inverted. And this is the timeline uh, as a whole. So what about ST elevation in disguise? There are several patterns or, or presentations that a patient could present with that does not meet the criteria of uh, ST elevation in MI, and they used to be called ST uh, elevation in MI equivalent. And we know that uh, the ECG is not diagnostic in up to 25% of uh, cases or even maybe normal. Uh, this, uh, in the 2013 guidelines, uh, includes lift bundle branch block that satisfies the criteria, the winter waves, lift main occlusion, hyperacute T wave, and isolated posterior wall uh, MI. Another high risk, but it's not MI uh, equivalent, is Willens syndrome, which we, uh, come we will come across also during our discussion. It's equivalent to non-STEMI rather than STEMI. And probably you heard our discussion several times uh, in the morning uh, report about Willens uh, syndrome. So if we look at bundle branch block, whether it's left or right, it is associated with poor uh, prognosis. In the old guidelines, the recommendation was to repair fuse patient with left bundle, but not with the right bundle. However, the new guidelines, the 2017 AC guidelines and the update also, that comes from the American College of Cardiology that reperfusion should be considered in both in the right setting. So presence of left or right bundle branch block alone is not an indication unless there is the right setting of uh, stem. So they are both considered equal and intervention, uh, intervention strategy is recommended in these patients in the right setting. Uh, and the basis of this recommendation is that in a study of almost uh, 7,000 patients, right bundle branch block was found in 6.3, with or without left anterior fascicular block or posterior. The in-hospital mortality in these patients was like left bundle. There was no difference, which is around 14% uh, in both. Cardiogenic shock was high in both, around 15%. The in-hospital mortality was highest with new bundle, left right bundle branch block. So the prognosis of right bundle is not benign as we used to think. It has a very high in hospital uh, mortality, followed by new uh, left bundle branch block. And even the presence of all left bundle or all right bundle, right bundle is also associated with higher uh, in hospital mortality. If you look at a new right bundle uh, branch block, especially when there is left anterior fascicular block, it indicates left main occlusion in around 25% of patients who presents with massive anterior wall MI or cardiogenic shock or even cardiac arrest. So right bundle is a high risk feature, especially when it's uh, new. Uh, left bundle branch block is always a dilemma when we try to diagnose ST elevation in MI. It is rare in general population. It's around 0.1% uh, uh, or one in a thousand or even less. However, we have to remember that heart failure patient, the incidence of lift bundle is very high. It's up to 33% and it's even higher when the LV function is uh, very depressed. In acute MI, 7% of acute MI, they have left bundle branch block. 
and it's new in only 3.3 percent that's why the guideline does not consider left bundle branch block alone as an indication of uh, revascularization or activation of the cat lab because left bundle is a very large structure it's supplied by the LED and the RCA so the MI has to be extremely large to cause such uh, left bundle branch block so the new guidelines new left bundle branch block is not considered ST elevation MI okay so it's no longer in the guideline an indication to activate the cath lab. However, when you find a new lift bundle branch block, you will just not ignore it. You will do a careful workup for acute cranial syndrome. You will look for the symptoms. You will do ECG, uh, sorry, uh, echo and trombonines to make sure that there's no infarction. But there's no need to panic or the activate to activate the cath uh, lab, whether it's old or a new lift bundle branch block. And the new data suggests that chest pain in patients with new lift bundle branch block, these patients, they have very little increased risk of MI compared to patients without lift bundle branch uh, block. So the risk of MI does not depend of, uh, on the presence of lift bundle branch block. Whether it's there or not, the risk is minimal in these patients. So the old guidelines used to consider lift bundle as an ST elevation MI equivalent, uh, especially when it's new or presumed uh, new lift bundle. However, the new guidelines, they don't consider uh, lift bundle branch block as ST elevation MI equivalent. Uh, the 2017 EAC guidelines, their comment is that diagnosis of MI in these patients is difficult. You should consider the Scarbosa criteria and look at concord concordant ST uh, elevation, which is the best indication of uh, ongoing ischemia. However, if the clinical uh, suspicion is very high, then you manage them as uh, ST elevation MI. Again, studies has shown uh, ha have shown that uh, lift bundle branch block is a major cause of false activation of the cardiac cath lab. And only 22 to 26 of these patients, they really benefit from activation or immediate uh, primary BCI. So 75%, they will not benefit. That's why you have to stratify these patients and make sure that they have uh, ST elevation in MI before you take them to the cath lab. However, if you take a patient with suspected MI and left bundle branch block, 50% will tend to have MI. And when we say MI, it means ST elevation and non-ST elevation. So around 25% will have ST elevation MI and 25% will have non-ST elevation MI. In view of this, the 2013 SCCHA guidelines stated that left bundle branch block should not be considered diagnostic of MI in isolation. If anything is not clear, please stop me at uh, any time. So when do you activate the cath lab in patient with left bundle branch block? You activate the cath lab in three uh, conditions. If the patient is unstable, he presents with left bundle branch with hypotension, pulmonary edema, or arrhythmias or electrical instability. Or if the Scarbosa criteria is, are satisfied, or the modified criteria are satisfied. So now we will look at the left bundle, which is, I think, always the most difficult uh, ACG when you think whether the patient has uh, ST elevation in my or no ST elevation in my. This is the normal left bundle. Always the, there is discordance between the T wave and the QRS or the ST segment and the QRS. When the QRS is up, like uh, in lead V4, V5, V6, the T wave and the ST segment will be depressed. And the opposite in the uh, other lead, when, the, when there is a prominent or the QRS is uh, downwards the, or inverted, the SC segment will be elevated. This is called appropriate discordance. So this is the appropriate in, ST, uh, in, in left bundle branch block. When this is reverted, this is called concordance. Now they will be concordant like when there is ST depression where it's supposed to be elevated or there is ST elevation when it is supposed to be depressed. Is it clear? Yes. Okay, 
So there are three criteria uh, to diagnose ST elevation in my and left bundle branch block. The first one, which was developed in the, in the 90s, I think, or early 2000, it was the Scarbosa criteria. Uh, and it relies on measuring the concordance or disconcordance at the J-bond. So you decide where is the J-bond, and then you decide where is the concordance or uh, disconcordance. And there are, as I said, three uh, criteria, which are Scarbosa criteria, modified Smith Scarbosa criteria, and Barcelona al algorithm, which was uh, published in uh, last year, 2020, in the American Heart uh, Journal. So we look at Scarbosa criteria. You consider the presence of MI if there is concordant ST elevation in leads with positive. QRS, which is usually V456. Uh, here, the SC segment should be depressed. If there is one millimeter ST elevation, this is called concordant ST elevation and given five point. Or if there is concordant ST depression and lead V1 to V3, uh, again, where it is supposed to be uh, elevated in these leads, if there is ST depression more than one millimeter, again, this is given three points. So the highest is for ST elevation, concordant ST elevation, then for uh, concordant ST depression, and the least specific and sensitive point is the third one, where you consider more than five millimeter uh, ST uh, elevation and leads with disconcordant uh, QRS. So if, the score is more than three, it's highly specific, but it has very low sensitivity. The higher, if you have all the three criteria fulfilled, of course, the probability of MI is higher and the sensitivity is higher. However, in general, Scarbosa has very low sensitivity, but high specificity, which means if it's positive, it's highly specific for MI, but if it's negative, it's not sensitive to rule out myocardial infarction. Scarbosa can be also applied to patients with uh, base rhythm exactly the same, with the same sensitivity and uh, specificity. Okay, who wants to read this ECG? Anyone? Okay, this ECG okay. shows uh, inferior uh, STEMI, infer uh, elevation in the inferior leads with the reciprocal changes in the lateral uh, one and AVL. Also there is ST elevation in V5 and six. So anterior exactly. lateral so, MI. Mm -hmm. So there's concordant ST elevation in V5 and V6. Okay, also in lead uh, three. If you look at lead, uh, sorry, lead two. If you look at lead three, definitely it's more, than, it's more than five uh, millimeters. So two. Yeah, lead two, there's a ST elevation, which is concordant. So we have concordant ST elevation in two, V5 and V6, and we have discordant ST elevation more than five millimeters and lead three. Okay, so this is what we see. Again, there is ST depression in V1, V2, and V3. This should not be there, isn't it? This should be elevated because the QRS is negative. We <laughs> should not have ST uh, depression. Yes. And this is an anterior wall uh, MI. Okay, what about this ECG? Uh, this is left in the branch block. Um, to see it's coordinate, VB1, more than five millimeter. This coordinate. Okay. So let's apply the criteria. Is there concordant ST elevation more than one millimeter? Always when you say concordant, we look at these leads. The leads was with positive QRS. We don't have okay. concordant. Sorry? Huh? We don't have concordant ST yeah. elevation. Is there he had trauma? Yeah. Is there Khalik Mintahani al Khin Tiala Hadi? Okay, is there concordant ST depression in V1, V3 
to V3? No. no. So no. we don't have concordant ST elevation. We don't have concordant ST depression. Is there ST elevation more than five? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. V... If you see, if you take this segment, the TB segment, this is definitely more than five. Again, if you look at V2, V3, V4, it's more than five. So is this steamy? It's only no. two points. Okay, there are only two points. So this is not ST elevation uh, MI. Okay, because you need more than three uh, criteria. This is another example uh, of criteria scarbosa criteria positive, you find that there is ST elevation concordant in V5, V6, and there is ST elevation more than five millimeters. So here we have five and two, it's seven. Okay, this is another example where you have three, which is concordant ST depression in V2 and V3, indicating an uh, anterior or a septal, oh, sorry, anterior ST elevation in my. Okay, since the criteria of Scarboza are not very sensitive, Smith modified these criteria. He kept the first two criteria because they are highly sensitive and specific, and he only changed the third criteria, where he took in consideration the ST deviation in relation to the R or S wave. So if the ST elevation is more than 25% of the S wave, this is considered MI. Or if the ST depression is more than 25% of the R wave, this is again considered MI, depends on uh, the lead. So the first two criteria are the same, but it's he took instead of five millimeters, he, he considered ST deviation in relation to the R or S wave. And this increased sensitivity from 52 to 91. And if you not see 52 is different from 38 because of taking the two criteria together. Uh, but the specificity decreased to 90%, which is still excellent uh, compared to uh, Scarboza criteria. So what he did exactly is that he took the ST depression in relation to the R wave or the ST elevation in relation to the S wave. So if this is more than 25%, it is uh, ST elevation in my with high sensitivity and specificity. So if we take in consideration, you see the two criteria, the first two criteria are the same, but the third one is different from Scarboza where you consider the ratio of the SC deviation to the R or the S uh, wave. Okay, let's apply this criteria to this lead. First, apply the Scarboza criteria. Is there a elevation in mind? Anyone? Uh, no, you didn't see actually any ST any concordant ST elevation. Uh, or no any like ST depression. The only okay, thing this is true. There is no concordant ST elevation. There is no concordant ST depression. Okay, so Scarboza is negative. What about modified Scarboza? Even the modified scarboza, the, I mean. If you, of course you need to measure it, but if you look at V1, V2 and V3, you will find the ratio, okay, is more than, it's two, 26, 38 and 32. This indicates that this patient has in mind. That's why modified scarboza is more sensitive when you consider the ratio. And this patient should be taken to the cat lab based on modified Scarboza criteria. Okay, and when he was taken, they found that he has uh, LAD occlusion. Okay, what about this ECG? Anyone? Again, just to make it short, Scarboza is negative. There's only one criteria, which is two, which is more than five millimeters uh, ST elevation. Uh, however, when you apply the uh, modified Scarboza, you will find that it is positive in V1, V2, V3, V4, and V5, uh, V6. It's, it's actually positive in, in uh, this is V5, not v, V4. It's, it's positive in, uh, from lead one to uh, v, uh, V5. 
V3, I did not mention it here because it's cut off by the ECG. So this is again by Scarbosa, it's negative, but by modified Scarbosa, it is positive. This gives you the value uh, of modified Scarbosa in uh, these patients. A new algorithm now, again, to increase the sensitivity and to uh, make value of uh, a new criteria, uh, it's called Barcelona algorithm. Uh, again, they modified the third criteria and instead of five millimeters or instead of the ratio, they looked at the leads with low voltage. Any lead with voltage less than six, there has to be no ST deviation, either elevation or depression more than one millimeter. If there's ST deviation in these leads more than one millimeter, it indicates uh, ST elevation in mind. And this increased the sensitivity up 95 person. So if it's negative, you can rule, rule out acute MI in 95 person. While in modified Scarbosa, if it's negative, you rule out MI in 90 uh, person. So let's see how do we read uh, or how to apply it. It's a little bit difficult and tricky. So you look first at the leads where the QRS is small, like in AVL, like in AVR, like in uh, AVF, like in V6. And you take these leads. You draw a line from the TB segment to the, uh, ST, uh, uh, to the ST elevation, TB segment to ST elevation. If it's less than one, like here, it's 0.5. Uh, again, uh, like here, it's almost nothing. There's no, no depression. So here it's considered negative. So you look at uh, the first, of course, the first two criteria are again the same. It's only the third criteria. So you apply the first two criteria as Scarbosa, but the third criteria, you look, you look at leads with low voltage, uh, R wave or uh, S wave. And then you look at the SC deviation in, in relation to the beginning of the QRS. Uh, in this patient, for example, you look at lead at any lead, you don't find there's modified or non-modified or uh, or the original Scarbosa criteria as positive. But if you apply the Barcelona criteria in lead three, you will see that there is one millimeter ST depression, uh, ST uh, elevation. In AVR, again, there's one more than one millimeter ST elevation, and in AVL there's more than one millimeter ST depression. This indicated MI and the patient was uh, taken to the cat lab and found to have uh, LED occlusion. Again, in, in this patient, if you look at AVR, the voltage is low, less, less than uh, six millimeter. In V6, again, it's less than six millimeter. When you apply the same, you will find that there's ST elevation in AVR more than one and ST depression in V6 more than uh, one millimeter. Again, indicating the presence of anterior uh, ST elevation in my. So these criteria helps you in increasing the sensitivity or in ruling out MI. So you look at the leads with low voltage, less than six millimeter, and you apply the rule of one millimeter in relation to the beginning of the QRS. Most of the time you cannot apply it to the TB segment because it's always hectic in uh, left mantle uh, branch block. What are the other signs uh, of uh, left bundle uh, branch block? Uh, the presence of uh, a QR, a QR complex in one, V5, V6 is abnormal always. Also in lead two and three, there should be no Q in these uh, uh, leads. Again, there are two signs which are called Cabrera sign and Chapman sign. Uh, and just sorry. Okay, we we'll, the the first sign is Cabrera sign, which is a prominent notching in the ascending limb. Uh, of the uh, S wave in V2, V3, and V4. So notching here 
indicates the presence of old MI or acute MI if the old ECG was not showing it. But the sensitivity is uh, very poor for either acute MI, it's only 27%, and for uh, old MI. If it is there, it's helpful because it's highly specific. But if it's absence, it does not rule out myocardial uh, infarction. The Chapman sign is the opposite. It's notching of the ascending limb of the R wave in V1, AVL, and in V5 uh, and 6. And again, it has low sensitivity, but high specificity. So Cabrera is the ascending limb of the S wave from V1 to V4, is V2 to V4. Chapman's is the uh, ascending limb of the R uh, wave in one AVL V5, V6. These are specific, but they are not sensitive. So how do you diagnose uh, MI and left bundle branch block? According to uh, the EEC and ACC guidelines, they consider this uh, algorithm. Uh, in patients with left bundle branch block, if he's hemodynamically instable or unstable, and there is uh, acute heart failure, pulmonary edema, electrical instability, then you triage him to the cath lab and you treat him like non-esterification in mind. However, if he has only chest pain and left bundle branch block, you apply the Scarboza criteria. If they are positive, then you treat him like ST elevation MI and you take him to the cath lab. If they are negative, you go for the next step, which is bedside echo. If the bedside echo and the serial uh, thrombonin testing are positive, if the echo shows regionality uh, in the area you suspect, then uh, it's a mass, uh, it's a most likely ST elevation MI and you take him to the cath lab. If it is Positive again, this could be non stimmy if the Scarboza criteria are not applied or are not positive. If these two are negative, then it's non acute pain syndrome and the chest pain is most likely non cardiac and you can safely discharge, discharge the patient. This is an updated algorithm from 2020. So, any patient with suspected acute MI and left bundle branch block, regardless whether it's new or old. First, you look at the clinical status. Is he hemodynamic uh, stable or, he, or is he unstable and in acute heart failure? If yes, you triage him to the cath lab. If no, you look at Scarboza criteria. If they are positive, cath lab. Negative, you go to the next step. You apply the modified Scarboza, which is the third criteria, uh, the STS ratio, more than uh, 25%. If it's Positive, you take them to the cath lab. If it's negative, you do the serial ECG, serial thrombonin and bedside echo. If it's abnormal, you triage him to the cath lab. If it's normal, you could either discharge him or to the clinic for non-invasive evaluation. However, this patient could have unstable angina. So you may not discharge him. You could admit him as unstable angina rather than uh, ST or non-ST elevation uh, MI. Is this clear? This is very simple, by the way. And if you apply the algorithm, you can easily rule in or rule out MI in these patients. So you look at clinical status, Scarboza criteria, the original, then the modified. If all are negative, then you go for uh, the serial ECG, troponin, and bedside echo. If it's normal, this is not STEMI, you can rule it out with confidence in this uh, patient. But you cannot rule out unstable uh, angina. So the take home uh, message for lift bundle branch block is that a new lift bundle branch block is not specific enough for acute MI. And it led to many false activation of the cardiac cath lab. Again, new lift bundle branch block alone is not an indication as we mentioned for the cath, for activation of the cath lab. It has to be associated with the features in the previous uh, algorithm. Scarboza criteria are specific, but they are not sensitive. Uh, and not sensitive means that you could deny the patient uh, the taking him to the cath lab because they are negative. So it's not sensitive. Modified criteria are more sensitive, and the Barcelona criteria are even more sensitive, but yet to be adopted and validated by uh, large uh, trials. And you have to remember that many of us, consultants, fellows, uh, in cardiology, we are not familiar with 
these uh, criteria uh, because we don't apply it most of the time. And, you know, left bundle branch block with STEMI is really uh, not that common, as we said, it's around 7%. So 93% of these patients they don't have left bundle branch block. So you have to be familiar with it. Inshallah, when I give you the handout, you can really keep it in your mobile, the uh, slide where the algorithm is, you can apply it easily. You can also keep uh, the summary, which will be at the end of uh, this session, inshallah, uh, in your, in the localization, how to diagnose inferior, posterior, right, and so on. In your mobile, you can always go back to it uh, to make your life easy and to make our life easy when, when you call us. Because believe me, after a month, I will not remember this uh, presentation. So when do you activate the CAT lab? If the patient is unstable, if the Scarboza criteria are satisfied, whether modified or non-modified. We'll talk about right bundle and then probably we'll stop and we will continue the lecture in, in uh, uh, probably next week because it's very long. Uh, right bundle again is, is uh, a high risk feature in patients with ST elevation in mind. Again, right bundle alone is not an indication to activate the cat lab. You activate the cat lab if it's new and proved to be new where previous ECG did not show it because as we said, new lift bundle brush block indicates lift main occlusion or LAD in, in, in most of the cases because it's supplied by uh, the LAD or if the patient has ST elevation. Uh, and the evidence from studies that new right bundle branch block without ST elevation is associated with TIMI zero to two flow in 66 of patients. That's why new right bundle branch block, unlike a new lift bundle, is an indication to activate the CAT lab. In the old guidelines, new right bundle branch block was not even there. Uh, and if it's associated with STT changes, okay, it's almost 90% they have uh, TME flow zero or one. So the R3 is occluded in these patients if it's new and almost 66% and if it's uh, old or new with SC changes and 90%. That's why the 2017 guidelines recommended CAT for patients with new right bundle branch block or right bundle branch block in the right clinical setting. So right clinical setting means that it's new or there's with uh, ischemia, evidence of ischemia from history or uh, trombonine or echo, or right bundle, right bundle branch block with ST elevation. And again, to remember that uh, the right bundle is supplied by the LAD first septal. So new right bundle occurs in proximal LAD or left main occlusion. And it, you can see it in around three to seven percent of acute MI. Again, it's uncommon because you know such massive MI is uh, uncommon in these patients. So, uh, lift bundle, as we discussed earlier, the main dilemma and difficulty that it affects the ST segment. So, it interferes with the ECG changes uh, diagnosis of MI. While right bundle, it affects the terminal part of the QR. S, but it does not interfere with the ST segment. So you will find that there is wide QR segment with S wave, but the ST segment will be normal and not affected. That's why you can easily apply the criteria for diagnosis of MI more than ST, more than one millimeter ST elevation in all leads, except as we discussed earlier. However, we have to know that right bundle branch block is associated with poor outcome because of the arterial supply. So how, in, in sometimes you really cannot decide whether there is ST elevation or not. So what do you do? You take, this is a right bundle without uh, ST elevation. You look at the J point, you drop a line. You take the TB segment and you draw a line. If the ST elevation of the J point or the end of the QRS is more than one, this is ST elevation, okay? If we apply it to the next, uh, to the left uh, ECG, we drop the line from the uh, J point and we draw a line from the TB segment and you will find that there's significant uh, ST elevation. Always identify the end of the QRS. 
Once you are identified, it's easy to diagnose ST elevation in my whether anterior, inferior, posterior, whatever in these uh, patients. Okay, this is again a right bundle branch block with the uh, anterior MI, and easily if we apply the rule, we draw a line and draw another line from the TP segment, you will find that there's significant ST elevation in V2, V3, uh, and uh, V4. This is uh, an, another example where there's extensive uh, ST elevation. Again, if you apply the same rule, you drop a line at the end of the QRS and you draw a line uh, from the TB segment, you can easily identify the ST uh, elevation. Always remember this rule when you look at uh, lift bundle uh, branch block. This is another example of inferior uh, STEMI. This shows you easily that right bundle does not interfere with the ECG changes of uh, ST elevation uh, MI. The last one will be RV basing. And as we said, we apply the same criteria, uh, Scarboza criteria, who wants to read this ECG? Yalla, akhir wahda. Okay, there is concordant ST depression in V2, V3, V4, and V5. And the ST depression here is more than one millimeter. How many bones is this? It's three. So this is a posterior wall MI. Again, if you remember, just reverse, reverse the ECG, and you, you will see that this ST elevation is rather an ST, uh, ST depression, is ST elevation indicating posterior wall uh, MI. And in GASTO trial, they found that, that the most important two criteria is ST elevation more than one millimeter in leads with concordant QRS, or ST depression more than one millimeter in V1, V2, or V3, which applies to this uh, ECG. You know, this presentation is really long. It's almost 10 o'clock. And we still have so many ECGs to, uh, I mean, conditions to uh, discuss. So probably we'll continue in uh, next session. What do you think? Yes, we can. Continue. Because we still have to discuss, uh, you know, LVH. We have to discuss the de winter mm -hmm. uh, wave, we have to discuss the early repolarization, we have to discuss how to differentiate uh, STEMI uh, from uh, pericarditis or early repolarization or hyperacute T wave, which can be normal or due to uh, other causes, Willing syndrome uh, and so on. So probably we will continue in another uh, session. This ECG, by the way, I'm just going fast. It's still too long. I think we'll finish at 12 o'clock if we continue. So maybe we can um, carry we can on the next session. The next session, yeah. Okay, is there any question or anything not understood? Please. Okay, maybe next session we'll start with a summary slide of what we presented today or an ECG with a test. Okay, we'll see how much did you really get from uh, this presentation? And I said, don't, as I said earlier, don't feel frustrated. This is a very difficult subject, by the way. When you come to uh, so many informations and criteria to know about RV, uh, AVL, uh, posterior leads, inferior leads, so many criteria to remember, and you don't practice it usually. So you will forget it. That's why the best way is to keep it with you either in notes or in uh, your mobile. Next session, inshallah, we will start with a summary slide for uh, all what we discussed that you can keep in, in, in uh, your mobile. Uh, and then we'll carry on with uh, our session. If there's no questions, then we can conclude our uh, lecture for today. I hope this was informative. I know it's difficult and confusing, especially when you are uh, F1 or F2. It's a lot of information. Uh, it needs a lot of reading and, and practice. 
but with time, inshallah, you will you will master it with Allah Azza wa Jal. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Uh, please send me your email. I will send you the summary of uh, the previous uh, lecture about um, acute coronary syndrome. And it's mainly, it was mainly about the rule in, rule out of uh, acute MI, which is mainly non-ST elevation in my history and clinical. Uh, it's, it's in words document and you can add to it, modify it as, as you like or, or keep it as it is. But you will keep it as a reference for future reading, inshallah because it summarizes the guidelines and it summarizes the literature up to 2021. 20, uh, Maybe uh, in the future, every year you can add information to it. This is what I do usually, by the way. Uh, 